<laughs> okay, so let us start. We have exceptional pleasure today to have here uh, Dr. Bas Grans uh, from uh, Netherlands. Here is uh, his affiliation, I guess. Uh, and a uh, few words of him. Okay. I might know it better than he does because we have been knowing each other for at least 10 years, yeah? Uh, okay, so he uh, got his PhD in Utrecht, Netherlands, in uh, computational plasma physics. His uh, undergraduate degree is in mathematics, right? Okay. Uh, in this institution, you shouldn't hide that. It's, it's good. Uh, so, after that, uh, he came to New York at the NYU of the Thank you very much. Uh, and he worked at Current Institute for many years, more than 10, I guess 14, something like that, uh, on uh, computational fluid dynamics. And after that, uh, he was, uh, again, significant number of years at Amory University in Georgia, uh, doing uh, computational chemistry on close to it, yeah. And after that, uh, uh, he got position as the head of atomic and data unit at the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. That's where we know each other from, okay. And uh, so, uh, through that work, uh, uh, he more focused uh, toward uh, atomic physics problems, uh, and uh, currently uh, he is uh, uh, focused on uh, molecular computational physics. He will tell more about uh, his current and future plans and work. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you, Gustav. Um, thank you, and Robert Harrison, not here, for uh, having me over for two days. It's a nice visit. Uh, this is going to be, I'm reusing a talk that I gave this summer at the Graduate School of China Academy of Engineering Physics. Um, same topic. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is a bit of a survey talk. Um, I have a background myself in um, modeling of small molecules. This, however, is much larger systems. Uh, but there's an enormous amount of activity these days in uh, using machine learning neural networks and other machine learning approaches for creating force fields for molecular dynamics modeling. Uh, that's what I refer to here as atomistic modeling. So if you're from a chemistry, physics background, uh, atomistic modeling in this context means molecular dynamics uh, using force fields. Turns out that in the uh, machine learning community, there's a lot of overlap between this problem and three-dimensional image processing. And I will highlight uh, the connections between the two and the similarities of methods that are used. Uh, so quick introduction, um, and I'll focus on the new approaches uh, from the recent years from the big data and machine learning community. I have some supplements and we won't necessarily get there. It's, uh, I'm focusing on the machine learning aspects. So one slide on what is atomistic modeling, and then following <coughs> slide about the three-dimensional vision interest. Um, atomistic modeling, as I said, are atomistic dynamics. Um, if you're from a physics, chemistry, engineering background, you may recognize this. If you're from a vision background, forget it, and the next slide will have the vision background. So in molecular dynamics, we are considering a system of, let's say, capital N atoms. This can be a large number in the case of a material. It can be in the order of a thousands. Uh, let's denote the positions by capital X of I, I running from 1 to N. So X is in three-dimensional space. And these atoms interact according to some potential. And the potential, well, there's an important term, which is just pairwise interaction, but it's not limited to pairwise interaction. There are three body, four body, five body. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's a many body interaction. It may not even make sense to expand it as a sum of two body, three body terms. Uh, so the interaction potential 
is really a function of all coordinates simultaneously. The force is the negative gradient of the potential, and given the force at any configuration of these nuclei, you just solve Newton's equation of motion f equals m times a. So in this setup, uh, there's no electron dynamics. Everything about the electrons is incorporated in this potential, and that's called the Bergen-Oppenheimer approximation, also called the adiabatic approximation. Uh, so my interest in this stuff is going to be machine learning methods for approximating this interatomic potential given some training data. Um, I mentioned that there is also interest in certain other quantities, a dipole moment, a quadrupole moment, a polarizability, uh, lots of other properties are of interest. I will just focus on the potential energy because it's, it's the, the basic for everything else basic property. Fundamentally, uh, these quantities are obtained by expensive electronic factor calculations. And again, for the physicists, chemists among you, one tends to use for large systems density functional theory. Um, each individual calculation can be rather costly. Uh, if you want to do molecular dynamics for a large system for many time steps, it's, it's very often intractable to do this using at each time step the electron structure calculation. Instead, you want to rely on uh, fitted surfaces, surface here, potential energy surface, force field, uh, that are cheap to evaluate. So the fitting is the machine learning bit. Fitting, machine learning, regression analysis, I use the word interchangeably. Now there is, uh, I said, uh, n atoms and n can be very large, and the potential depends on all atoms. Yes, but it's dominated by nearby atoms, but not by parasite. I mean, parasite interactions are important. It's dominated by a local environment. So at some point, we're going to use that the potential can really be represented as a superposition of local potentials. OK, that's the atomistic bit. I will ask him over this. Three-dimensional image processing. Superficially, a totally different story, but there'll be uh, uh, important commonalities. Um, of course, two-dimensional image processing is, is very familiar. We've all seen uh, the successes, especially in recent years, of convolutional neural networks in making sense of a two-dimensional pixel image. So the image then is, let's say, uh, an array of pixels, two-dimensional array, at each pixel, you have a grayscale. Or maybe you have three grayscales and then it's a color image. Um, so a two-dimensional regular array. Uh, what about three dimensions? Well, in three dimensions, of course, you can just extend the two-dimensional two concept to three. Then you have a box, a three-dimensional array. And at each point of that box, at each element of that three-dimensional array, you can have some, some properties, a density or something, or real number properties. But in many cases, it suffices to just characterize the surface of the 3D object. And then this three-dimensional box, this what is called voxel image, is not very efficient. So if you're only interested in the surface of the 3D object, then you might just want to represent that surface. And you represent that surface, for instance, by a cloud of points. We're not too precise now about how these points have to be located on the surface. Let's assume that you have some way of spreading points over the surface. And now the, the user, so to speak, is given that cloud of points. And associated with each point, there may be one or more properties, uh, a color, uh, a material composition, uh, whatever properties are of interest for the object. And the machine learning task would be uh, given that cloud of points. And given some training data, say something sensible about the object. So the training data might classify the object as, as you know, cars of certain mix. And the machine learning task would then be you know, learn how to assign those classifications, given the coordinates of the cloud of points, and the values of whatever properties you have at each point. Um, so each point may carry some properties. Again, I'm, I'm always dealing here with supervised learning. So 
somehow uh, training data have to be produced, and I'm not concerned with how that is done. I'm concerned with the machine learning part that given the training data uh, will learn those properties. There are obvious similarities to atomistic modeling in the case of uh, a system of atoms. You can view that again as a cloud of points in three-dimensional space. And the property would be the energy. It's a continuous property. You should not fit it. In machine learning, for vision, typically you have a classification problem. But the techniques are not so much, uh, are not so much different. Um, a key point in the methods that I will describe is um, that whatever you're learning is, should be invariant under translation or rotation of the object. Natural property. If you just rotate the object a bit, it's the same object. Let's assume that we're dealing with properties that are invariant under rotation. Um, there are differences with atomistic modeling. Uh, in this case, with the cloud of points characterizing the surface, you know, <coughs> binary interactions are not really of any importance. It's, the important thing is the distribution of points. If you want to express that through some kernel method, it's really the long range. Uh, interaction, if you use the language of interaction, the long-range interaction would be more important here than the pairwise interaction. In addition, there are sort of objects that you might want to classify in vision. Typically, it's a different object if you invert it with respect to a point, whereas the potential energy in the atomistic system remains unchanged. So there are some differences, but in both cases, we're dealing with data that represent a cloud of points and some properties for each of those points. In addition, as I mentioned, we would like to learn properties that are invariant under rotation or translation. And I have one slide on this, and maybe I'll go over it very quickly and come back to this. Uh, so this is for the more mathematically inclined. Um, if we have a group of transformations, and to be specific, let's think of rotations of three-dimensional space. We may then consider functions between two vector spaces, u and v. Um, and each of these vector spaces, there might be an action of the group on this vector space, and also an action of the group on this vector space. Now, a function f from u to v is called Covariant and also called equivariant, they're the same concept. If for all elements of the group and for all elements of the left hand space, the function applied to the transformed argument, so think of applying the rotation to the argument, is the same as applying the rotation on the second space to evaluate the function at the original argument, and then apply the rotation. So you can apply the rotation first, or apply the rotation on the right-hand side. If you get the same result for every set of points, for every point and for every element of the group, then you call this a covariant function. Uh, the invariants are the special case when on the right-hand side, the group is just the identity. So the energy is under rotation and invariant. You rotate your molecule, the energy doesn't change. The dipole moment is a covariant. You rotate your molecule, the dipole moment will rotate with it. So both concepts are of interest for atomistic modeling. For classification problems in vision, invariants are obviously the first thing that you think of. But maybe there are stress quantities or something, and they would again have a tensor property. So both invariants and covariants are of interest. Um, and a key point in the work that I will review is that the machine learning fitting or learning, fitting is the traditional language, uh, function fitting, machine learning is the modern language, and, and is appropriate for certain technologies, large data sets, and especially the neural networks, uh, of course, that machine learning. In many other cases, I find the language of function fitting just as appropriate. But for the large scale neural networks, uh, machine learning is the new technology. Let me do a very simple example. Function f, n-dimensional space to a real space. So just a scalar quantity of n variables. Let's say x point in the n-dimensional space, z a real point. So we have this function f of x equals z. Um, and we have a lot of data. 
Um, we have data points x sub alpha associated with each data point. There is a function value z sub alpha. So we have our training data. Um, and let's say that the training data comes from a function that is totally symmetric under interchange of these n um, arguments. So it's, once again, a function of n variables, but let's say totally symmetric under any permutation of these arguments. Now we want to learn this function. So we have three different options here, and you might think some are good options and some are bad options, but actually all three options are used in serious work. So all three are credible. One, ignore the symmetry. Use any plausible model. Just forget that your data, the training data, comes from a symmetric model. Ignore that. Just fit uh, a function that you may have used in a different context, but use enough training data. If the training data obey the symmetry and you're fitting to those training data, to within some accuracy, your fitted function will obey the same symmetries. Not exactly. If you don't build it into the model, you won't have an exact representation of the symmetry. But using enough training data, you get it at convergence. So obtain the symmetry via accuracy. Another approach is to build the symmetry into the model. And if you're a classically trained numerical analyst, you'd say that's what has to be done, right? I know that I'm fitting a symmetric function. I use a basis for my function space that obeys that symmetry. And in the case of this example, that's actually not too difficult. So you, you build in the symmetry, you fit it, and the symmetry is exactly obeyed. In, some, in, in many applications, this can be technically really messy. It can be really messy to come up with a basis set of functions that obey all the symmetries that are of interest. Um, and so as a compromise between completely ignoring the symmetry and building it in, but finding it not possible to build it in, there's an approach that we'll also see. Um, try to build in the symmetry. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll skip this to an example uh, later. Build in the symmetry in a way that, that can be generalized. Um, but that may not be so ideal. So for instance here, once again, uh, if you want to fit a function that's totally symmetric under any permutation of these arguments, then I can do the following. Given a set x1 to xn, real numbers, I'll sort them in ascending order. I'll use my training data only for functions, for arguments that have been sorted in ascending order. I fit my function. Now, when I want to apply the fitted function, again, I'm given an arbitrary point in n-dimensional space. I'll sort the numbers in ascending order, and I will apply my fitted function. Okay, that's a perfectly reasonable way to fit a completely symmetric function. I build in the symmetry in a way explicitly, because I will always sort the arguments in ascending order. So whatever the original permutation, we get into the same canonical form. It, of course, introduces non-smoothness, derivative discontinuities, as two arguments cross. If you try to do this for points x1 to xn, where each point is a point in three-dimensional space, well, now you might sort by distance to the origin, but now it's not just introducing derivative discontinuities, but real discontinuities as two distances uh, cross. So this is not so attractive, but in some cases, it's a really practical way to do things. Some general remarks about uh, machine learning, new approaches from big data and machine learning. Uh, so it's been, of course, uh, an, an extremely booming area, and especially booming maybe the last four or five years or so, maybe even less. Um, spectacular, I, I, think, I think the application uh, in uh, AlphaGo uh, really brought a lot of wide recognition to the field. If you look more closely at what the AlphaGo people did, they were using techniques that had been very successful in vision, the two-dimensional convolutional neural networks. They had been very successful in vision for maybe 10 years or so. Um, and of course, machine learning goes back much further than that. But I would say that the successes of deep convolutional neural networks, um, deep networks of convolutional nature, they go back the past 10 years, but there's really been a flurry of activity even much more recently than that. Um, machine learning, in addition to the specific methods, it's bringing a change of attitude. 
And I mentioned a few points of that change of attitude, which one also finds now in other big data fields, not related to neural networks. There's nothing wrong with optimizing over very many variables, millions of variables. Uh, the typical AlphaGo or Vision network has maybe 40 million neurons, and each of these neurons has a weight, or each connect, sorry, 40 million connections. Each connection has a weight associated with it. So you're optimizing over space of 40 million or so unknowns. There's nothing wrong with optimizing when there's lots of local minima, even in equivalent local minima. Uh, you don't care, ask for a guaranteed global optimum. You're not going to get that guarantee. You don't ask for it. Uh, the test is the quality of your fit as you have obtained uh, your work in practice. You don't even converge to a local optimum in the typical machine learning business. You do stochastic gradient descent. You wind up in some basin, but you don't try even within that basin. You tend not to try to find even the local minimum, never mind the global optimum. An example of the lots of local minima, uh, this is an AlphaGo example, 20 layers, 256 nodes per layer, moderate size. I mean, it's big, but, but people use bigger networks as well. Um, I find that uh, this is a nonlinear optimization problem, and every state is replicated about 10 to the power 10,000 times. Uh, and that number comes about because all the nodes are, in a sense, equivalent. So within any layer, you can permute these 256 nodes anyway and come up with an equivalent neural network. So that's 256 factorial to the power 20. Work it out, it's 10 to the power more than 10,000. Um, and for some nonlinearities in the neural network, there is an additional factor 2 to the power 256 to the power 20. This is if you use, for instance, the tange function, which is invertible, right? Anti-symmetric. But if you use the rectified linear unit, then you don't have that. But if you also have uh, the pointwise, the reflection symmetry, you wind up with this number. So lots of local minima, there's nothing wrong with it. So I'll focus now on the atomistic modeling and the machine vision applications. And in the atomistic modeling, once again, we have to fit or learn an energy or its gradients, the force field, or some other properties as a function of atomic positions and atom types. Positions in three-dimensional space, and the atom type is basically, is this a hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, etc. Three-dimensional image processing, fit or learn properties of an object as a function of coordinates of a cloud of points on the surface of that object. Um, and yeah, I'll, I like to say the atomistic problem has a long history, chemists will know, material scientists will know, of um, empirical, physically motivated forces. Here are some key words. Typically, they use mechanical models. So they say the atoms, nearby atoms are bonded, and there's uh, heuristics for deciding what are the bonds and what's the nature of the bonds. And now, we assign to each bond a string, a string constant for vibrational motion. We assign to each pair of bonds emanating from the same atom, a bending um, variable, and then a potential that, that acts on that bending variable, and again, has a minimum at whatever is your minimum geometry. And these coefficients get fitted to uh, data, but it's all rather physically motivated. The big data approaches, of course, are, are not physically motivated in that way. Uh, they put in some gross properties that are important, like invariance under rotation, uh, but not this um, detailed uh, physical model. Um, and they come really in two flavors, uh, the big data approaches. On the one hand, there's something that has been known in the statistical function fitting community for a long time as richly parameterized linear models. Uh, so typically situations, even where the number of free parameters can be larger than the number of data points that you have, which means that you need to do a lot of regularization. Uh, but in the statistics literature of 20 years ago, you find this language used very much, richly parameterized linear models, big data linear regression. Presently, the language, well, uh, sorry, and then from the artificial intelligence community, deep neural networks. Presently, the word machine learning is, of course, applied to deep neural networks, but these days, what used to be called richly parameterized linear models are also called machine learning models in much of the literature. But it's, it's good to be aware, I think, of this language, because if you actually look for 
literature using this keyword, you find lots of stuff from 10, 20 years ago that is of interest and that we're absolutely not using language like artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, but it was using uh, big data and uh, stabilized regression. You know, I'm going to put down only one slide on the traditional big data approaches because I want to focus on the neural network uh, methods. I think they're currently uh, the more active area. But um, I'm happy to share these slides with people afterwards with all the references. Um, I mention them because they are quite visible in the atomistic modeling community. Uh, so there have been lots of applications uh, and material scientists would know Gaussian approximation potentials um, using smooth overlap of atomic potentials kernels. Uh, this is something that looks very much like in low dimensional settings radial basis functions. So you define functions of the distance and you center them on each atomic position and you look for your potential energy as a superposition of such localized basis functions. Uh, but in the case of the Gaussian approximation potential, it's done in a high dimensional space. So simultaneous coordinates for many atoms for a local environment. Um, this work comes <coughs> entirely from the um, material science community. Um, Chani is uh, head of the effort. He's at the University of Cambridge in the engineering department, material science. So this is really the atomistic modeling community. Uh, spherical wave expansion. That's a, again, I have more slides in supplementary material. Wavelets were introduced in the 1970s. Well, they go back much longer than that. But as a numerical analysis tool, they became popular in the 1970s. And Stéphane Malat is a key author, uh, especially for one-dimensional signal processing, where you want to do something local. You don't want to do a global Fourier transform, especially because the Fourier transform, is, there's a discontinuity somewhere. You know, through the Fourier transform, the effect is noticed everywhere. So the spherical, sorry, the wavelet expansion in 1D was a way of doing multi-resolution, so smooth to highly localized functions, uh, but without the long distance influence that is associated with, uh, with Fourier transform. Um, wavelet ex expansions were extended already in the 1980 or so applications were done of wavelets in multi-dimensional problems, two-dimensional and three-dimensional. Uh, they involve, just like the 1D wavelet, multi-resolution aspects, typically in, uh, in 3D expansion in spherical harmonics. Uh, spherical harmonics for the spherical part and then a radial function. And then the radial function done at different scales. Type scale for local effects, larger scales, just as in the 1D uh, wavelet approach. Uh, longer scales for longer distance effects. Very recently, in this work in 2018, the spherical harmonic wavelet expansion was applied to atomistic modeling. Um, and this was a nice application, but it was only one demonstration case. Uh, the community here is really uh, more interested in vision problems, uh, but they have this uh, one application in the reference here to an atomistic system. Something else, let me not even mention this, it again involves spherical harmonic expansions locally, spectral neighbor analysis potential. Again, it's large scale regression and something called an atomic cluster expansion. That's something that really involves the two body, three body, four body terms. But uh, this fellow Droughts is very interesting if you're in the applied physics community. He comes from a density functional theory background. So totally in the field of atomistic uh, modeling, material science. He recognizes this two-body, three-body, four-body expansion doesn't really work. It doesn't converge in a, in a proper way. So he has applied in this reference uh, some nonlinear modifications, which are highly technical. I haven't followed them myself in, in detail. But it's a way to fix up this two-body, three-body, four-body expansion to make it more or less convergent, even at the level of truncating it, like five-body expansions. Um, and it involves lots of training data and many, many coefficients. So this is the large scale linear regression approach. Um, so now, and for the rest of the talk, I will focus on the more recent developments in uh, neural networks. Um, 
And this community, the neural network community, uh, well, the first reference that I show is already quite old by the standards of large-scale neural networks, but it's, it's very well known in the field of, again, molecular dynamics, Bela Paginello. Um, key reference in 2007, but they were developing it earlier, and there have been lots of applications since usually with Bela as a co-author, but also just referencing Bela Parinello. Parinello has, is a very well-known name, and he's moved on to other things. Uh, and Bela is a well-known name as well. Um, they make a local ansatz. The potential is a sum, the total energy is a sum of energies associated with sort of I runs over all the, the atoms in the system. For each, each atom has a type. Right? Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, etc. Each atom has a type. And for each type of atom, there is a fitted potential. And this fitted potential depends on, well, the local neighborhood. So you take um, typically parameters characterizing the local neighborhood, like a local density convolved with a Gaussian, a local density convolved with a Gaussian, and in the spherical direction convolved with some spherical harmonics. Uh, local density convolved with the Gaussian type, some radial oscillatory function, maybe a Laguerre function. Um, but you just mentioned metals, okay, so they are not as, as local uh, for the... So the, the Gaussian, maybe instead of a Gaussian, you use something that goes rigorously to zero at finite distance. So then it's really local. Yeah, so this is uh, the Xi, it's a Gaussian relative to the, uh, to the atomic center of the ith atom. So that makes it a local environment. So you obtain some characteristic parameters of your local environment. Those become the input layer for your neural network. You also, again, we're also always doing supervised learning here. So one assumes that one has obtained by accurate calculations this potential energy V. One does not have this decomposition at first. One just has, for any large system, one has this total energy. Okay, nevertheless, you can use this as training data. Uh, fitting neural networks for all the different kinds of atoms, so to speak, simultaneously. So you have to learn the weights for different neural networks simultaneously, one neural network for each uh, atom type. Um, they make sure that the input functions, I said, you know, a spherical harmonic, Spherical harmonic is not rotationally invariant. It has some transformation properties. But by taking certain quadratic combinations, you create invariants. I won't go through this. So they, they use functions that are invariant under rotation um, and, and invariant under relabeling of the nuclei. And then finally, they have a feed-forward neural network for each of the atom types. And this has to be learned. So the weights in that neural network, that standard feed for neural network, have to be learned. Um, and learning the neural network, so what, just to review, a neural network means a bunch of neurons, sorry, a bunch of layers. At each layer, a set of neurons. A neuron is, of course, a biologically motivated term, but in the context of a neural network, it just means storage for a real variable. Right? So a neuron just means a real variable. Um, and the connection from layer L minus 1 to layer L involves dense linear algebra, so a matrix of weights multiplying the set of neurons at layer L minus 1, dense matrix of weights which depends on the, on, on the layers involved, the two neighboring layers, a displacement vector, so one displacement for each neuron, and then what is sometimes called an activation function or a nonlinearity, for which one often uses the rectified linear unit. Uh, the function phi is, in that case, zero for negative arguments and equal to the argument for positive arguments. So f of x is equal to the maximum of zero in x. That's another way to put it. That's the typical rectified linear unit. There are other functions that are used, but they are, they are chosen once in advance, and the weights and the displacements are the quantities that have to be learned. And that's because of this function and because you have to go from layer zero where you have your inputs to the final layer where you have your output. That may be a function on top of that still. Uh, 
It's a nonlinearity which is iterated. So this is a nonlinear optimization problem. However, the gradient is easily evaluated. So the gradient of the output relative to a variation of the weights, that's just backward differentiation. This function is constructed so that it's easily differentiated. And you can iterate that, uh, the gradient operator. So you can do backward differentiation and show the, the, the gradient of your final output relative to any weight is available. And so, okay, you have function values, you have gradients, you can do optimization. That's not a subject of this talk, but that's the hidden mechanism between finding the weights in a neural network that typically stochastic optimization is used for that. Um, now, once again, to look at the structure of this neural network, because I'm going to contrast it with some more recent neural networks. Um, let's take for granted that we have learned our neural networks, and now we're given a set of atoms. So a configuration of atoms in the capital N atoms in three-dimensional space. What to do? Well, um, we have to evaluate this sum over the atoms. For each atom, we have to evaluate these characteristic functions of the local environment. That becomes then the in, that those define the input layer for our local neural network. We evaluate that local neural network, V of A sub I, for those inputs. And we save that result and we accumulate the results of uh, these neural network evaluations in this sum. And that is finally the total energy. And finally, the total energy is what, is what matters. And that has to be then, to get a force field, differentiated with respect to the nuclear positions. Uh, so in a way, you have to evaluate, and you, you do that in parallel, of course. If it's n atoms, you're evaluating n times an independent uh, neural network calculation. Right? So the, the, for each atom, you have your local environment, you create the input layer, you run through the neural network up to the output layer, and you get a contribution to the total energy. So it's separate neural network calculations for each atom in the system. That can be contrasted with what I showed you. Is this done on flight? Excuse me? Is it done on flight and uh, and you consider more hyperdynamics or it, it done it's done once? No, it, it's done on flight. Yes. Right. For each time step in molecular dynamics, you have to do this force evaluation uh, or energy evaluation. So you really need the gradient of what I've described here. But the gradient is available analytically, actually. But yes, this has to be done at each time step in the molecular dynamics. Of course, learning the neural network has to be done only once. Right? So, so you learn the neural network, and after that, you... Uh, in a way, it replaces quantum mechanics. Correct. That's yeah. the idea. Yes. Yes. So instead of doing a density functional theory calculation at each time step, you evaluate mm -hmm. your learned function at each time step. <coughs> so, and, so, and in complexity, that is in typical cost of evaluation, this sits in between on a logarithmic scale density function theory, and these methods like charm, amber, gromax, uh, etc. And there's a pre factor of predefined potentials. The, uh, yeah. You're talking about uh, the machine learning potential yeah. might be ten to the four times faster to evaluate than a density functional theory calculation, and even then, it's ten to the four times slower to evaluate than a gromax. Right? There's an enormous difference between these mechanical models. Okay. And According to Murakuma, uh, the the range between the DFT calculations and the Classical calculations is uh, 10 to the 6. So you, well, maybe you would put. Six. You would put. So you somewhere, somewhere in between on a logarithmic scale. 1,000 yeah. times uh, slower than the, uh, than the classical. I mean, to define the uh, I'm, I'm not going to say the numbers. It's, okay. uh, it's much more costly than the classical mechanical models, and it's much more efficient than DFT. Mm -hmm. um, here's an approach that comes from Princeton University. Uh, with um, senior authors uh, Roberto Carr and Dainan Eu. So Eu is the last name here. Um, deep molecular dynamics. Again, they use uh, an ansatz, uh, just like Bela Pradinello, uh, local expansion. Um, they used a somewhat different approach to build in uh, the rotational invariance. And it's the thing that I alluded to already in an earlier slide. 
um, they decide, okay, we've got to make our local environment invariant on the rotation. Let's, for each atom, let's sort the neighboring atoms by increasing distance, and then use some cutoff. So this introduces these discontinuities. So they, they, they create descriptors. Um, let me not even go through the detail, because in a way, this work has really been superseded by subsequent work by the same group. I mention it only to say, you know, this is an example where you introduce these discontinuities, um, but you fit the neural network more or less like Bela Farinello did, and they show an application to liquid water uh, where they get good accuracy of the evaluated potential. I'm, I'm not confident that having a potential that has these discontinuities is a good idea. And in fact, they have, in, in subsequent work, uh, allowed it to be superseded by something that they call the deep potential smooth addition. Same group of people. And also a connection to uh, an institute in Beijing, China. Um, pretty much the same group of people. Roberto Carr and Benon Eu, again, as the, as the senior authors. Um, still somewhat similar to uh, Bela Farinello, uh, they create these local environments. A nice twist in this work, Bela Farinello, um, they decide by hand these are going to be my input descriptors. Certain quadratic combinations of spherical harmonic expansions of the local environment. Um, in this work, uh, the deep pot smooth addition, they actually used a neural network even to decide how to optimize the input layer. So they have now two levels of neural network. One to decide what's a good family of invariants for the input layer, and then totally following Bela Pardinello, a neural network to go from the input layer to the output energy. So I think I think using that two-stage neural network also to divide the input layer is really the novel aspect um, from uh, from the Princeton work that I showed here. Now I'm going to move a bit more to a machine learning perspective and make some more connection with uh, vision. Um, there is, a, uh, let me check my next uh, transparency here, uh, D pot SE, yeah. Yes, I, I somehow missed uh, this one. Um, so I, I do want to say a bit more about this approach here. Uh, Bela Parinello, as I said, um, for each atomic, for each atom, they have a local neural network. And they, these neural networks are, so to speak, evaluated in parallel without any crosstalk. Um, it's very nice work, I think, uh, in this Schnett approach, the Deep Tensor Network, Technical University of Berlin. Uh, Klaus Schutt is the lead author. Uh, Müller is the head of the group. Uh, uh, but, but Schutt is really the, the key developer of this uh, Schnett network. They do something rather different than uh, Bela Pardinello. Uh, so in Bela Pardinello, each atom has its neural network. The neural network has some predefined widths, which might be uh, 100 or 200 or so neurons, and that's it. Here, let's say they have n atoms. They put it all together in one big neural network. All the data together in one big neural network. So each neural network layer now contains an atomic feature vector for each atom. And the atomic feature vector might have 64 or 100 or so components. So each layer becomes an enormously large object, uh, very different from a traditional neural network. Moreover, in their work, they do not encode the positions into the input layer. They keep the positions as parameters. And now they create transitions between layers, so the transition from L minus 1 to L. Well, they create the transition in two steps. One the traditional type of transition, but applied one atom at a time, completely ignoring all the other atoms. So that's the dense linear algebra plus a displacement. And this is before the nonlinearity, so I'll forget about the nonlinearity. Um, and the other step is a convolution, but the convolution done uh, one feature at a time. 
So for each feature, they have a swarm of points living in three-dimensional space. And, well, a convolutional neural network uses a regular array of data, pixel image. But the convolution can be defined also if the points are just points in space. It uh, doesn't have to be on a regular mesh. So a convolution is well defined. And they, given a kernel for a convolution, and, and that's the kernel is encoded in this W prime uh, matrix, um, they have a feature-wise mapping where xi of L depends on all the i features at the L minus 1 layer for all the different atoms convolved with some kernel. And these convolutions have a Gaussian de decay, depends on the relative distance. And the convolutions have. So both this matrix W and this convolution kernel W prime have to be learned. Uh, but this is much more inspired by uh, the vision application. Um, but it's also, it has a nice twist that the uh, positions are kept as global parameters. They, they go into the kernel of the convolution. They're not encoded into the input layer. Um, the weights, the W and the W prime, are to be fitted and, and as functions of the, uh, of the positions. Uh, and operationally then, contrast this with uh, Bela Paganello. In Bela Paganello, for each atom, you encode the local environment and you run it through its own neural network. Here, all the layers are covered. In all the layers, you have complete data for the whole atomic system, and the locality is in the kernel of the convolution, which, which is a local operation. So I'm rather charmed by this uh, Schnett approach, and it has been extended into uh, the vision community by, uh, by, by other people. I'll, I'll mention a few examples. See that I'm nearing the end of my uh, time. I'm going to give a perspective now uh, from the machine learning side, the computer science side. Um, think of the basic feed-forward neural network where uh, the values of the neurons at level L are obtained from the values at level L minus 1 by a dense matrix vector multiplication plus a displacement followed by a nonlinearity, the rectified linear unit function, for example, applied pointwise. Now, if you look at this with a bit of a mathematical slant, you'd say, okay, in the basic feedforward neural network, each element of V is a real number. Let's imagine that instead of this, each element of V becomes not just a real number, but some structured value. Um, so instead of having uh, the elements V in a B dimension, uh, V in a B-dimensional real space, let's make it be copies of some, some space X, which might be mapped to K-dimensional real space, but it has some additional structure. And you let the transformation W have a corresponding structure. Well, that's a bit abstract. Let me give an example of this. The standard convolutional neural network, each capital X now represents a pixel image. So instead of having, you can view a convolutional neural network in the following way, Start with this picture, and with each neuron, associate not just a real value, but associate a pixel image. And then the uh, map, the W, has to, be, has to have a corresponding structure. That corresponding structure, in the case of the vision, is that the elements of W are convolutions with a compact kernel, a localized kernel. In the case of the uh, image processing or the pixel image, typically a 3 by 3 or so, at most 5 by 5 uh, local kernel. So this concept of having structured networks is quite familiar uh, if you think, if you use this language to describe a convolutional neural network. Another enrichment of this concept is the following. Consider a parameterized network. Let's, let's have some parameters, parameters P, which we're not going to put into the input layer. We're not going to encode these parameters into the input layer. Instead, at every layer, we're going to let the weights depend be functions of P. And we're going to have to let, learn the weights as functions of P. Okay, that looks at first 
it's a lot more complicated. Already learning the weights is nonlinear optimization. Now we're going to have to learn them as functions of some parameters. That's even more complicated. It turns out it isn't necessarily more complicated. These can be nonlinear. The weights can be nonlinear functions of p, so long as you use a linear regression formulation. For example, if the weights are polynomials in p, you just represent it coefficient times linear in p, coefficient times p squared, etc. And the unknowns are those coefficients, but those coefficients enter linearly. So if we can do, in, in order to learn the weights of a neural network, we have to be able to differentiate our output of the neural network relative to the weights. That we already know how to do, that's standard technology. And differentiating the weights with respect to those unknown coefficients, if we use a linear regression formulation, that's trivial, that's just linear. So learning a parameterized neural network is not really more complicated than learning a standard neural network. And in this uh, application to uh, uh, machine learning of atomistic data, the parameters can be the atomic positions, and that's an application that we saw in a HNET network. Well, the machine vision community has its own language, but they're totally aware of the application to atomistic modeling, and, and uh, here the fields really know each other. So the machine learning, the computer science people, are very familiar with what's been done in molecular dynamics modeling. Um, and the key words from the computer science community, point cloud convolutional networks, permutation equivariant neural networks, and quite often this code word deep sets is used, sets referring to point sets. Uh, this has received lots of references, uh, more than 100, maybe by now more than 200, neural information processing uh, symposium, I think it is, 2017. And, and they are, in the language that I just introduced, they are both structured and parameterized. They're parameterized in the sense that the point positions are kept as parameters, and they're structured in the sense that each point may carry some properties, a color, a material composition, whatever. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes other, even tensorial properties. Um, and there are a bunch of other uh, languages, phrases that have been used, so spider, CNN, point convolutional, deep convolutions, uh, so this is very active in the three-dimensional vision application. Um, point clouds with additional structure. I mentioned this because these two are, they come from the vision community, but they've made their own impact on atomistic modeling and are continuing to make an impact. Group equivariant convolutional neural networks introduced by Taco Cohen and Max Melling. Um, and spherical convolutional neural networks. Um, again, point cloud, each point carrying some properties. Earlier I said properties like uh, uh, color, uh, composition. Now think of some vector properties. And so now the vector has to rotate along with the object. And that's um, the concept of these SO3 group equivariant CNN. The group equivariant CNN was really meant for vector properties attached to a cloud of points and doing this in an invariant manner. Uh, so the group is the special orthogonal group in three dimensions. Tensor field networks. This is a group of people from Google, Stanford, and Caltech, I think. And they have really followed with due reference the Cohen and Belling work, but they've also implemented then this tensor field network into the Google code TensorFlow. So now you can use TensorFlow for neural network training and use input data that are tensor quantities. And note the word tensor in tensor field means a tensor as in physics, tensor under transformations of three dimensional space. In TensorFlow, tensor just means array of numbers. So here they're using those two words of tensor, you know, with, you have to be careful what meaning it is, but the two meanings combined. So tensor flow, the very well-known uh, neural network optimization code, now has the feature to do tensor fields, uh, meaning things that are invariant or covariant under rotations of space. So my conclusions. Um, lots of promising new approaches and a very active area uh, in, the, in the field of force fields 
with inspiration from big data and machine learning. I'm not taking, I'm not comparing the merits. It's, it's too, too difficult in many cases, and it's too recent. Um, but they're valuable related developments from machine learning. And there's good crosstalk between the two communities. Um, and uh, I, I won't even, let me not go even to the, the wish list for some of the developments that more for the chemistry audience. Um, but uh, it's very active research, and if you, if you look in this covariant neural networks, um, you'll find ongoing developments and, and ongoing applications. I think it's very promising. Um, I wouldn't say that it has completely displaced all other methods. As I said, it sits between DFT and the mechanical force fields. The mechanical force fields continue to have their role for long-time simulation. And there's another technology that sits at roughly the same level of complexity, and that's so-called semi-empirical or parameterized uh, DFT. So the competition is uh, alive. That's my conclusion. Thank you. Okay, questions? Okay, uh, while other people are talking. Okay. What is the biggest clinical system that you try to simulate using your model? Biggest clinical system? Biggest systems? Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. I don't know how many liquid water molecules were used. It would be suitable for thousands of atoms. I was thinking if you can do protein simulations with, with your machine learning. Um, so the, I, I cannot say what are the largest systems that have been used, uh, that have been demonstrated. And how does your method compare against the traditional inner methods that came by Charm? Yeah, yeah. It's so, going so to be more accurate than was for sure. But uh, these, these are, yeah, yeah, so the, the competition is, um, you know, you trade off accuracy versus speed. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, in none of this is my own work, right? This is a survey of uh, published literature. Um, there are cases where, for a limited application domain, the accuracy has been really spectacular. Okay. Uh, the Gaussian approximation potential is, is spectacularly accurate for crystals with defects. That's a bit of a limited application domain. Um, no, I, I don't want to. I don't want to make you know firm statements right. uh, because crystals don't move much. So you know, it is. So that's especially for dynamic molecules like proteins that right. might be like yeah, much more challenging as a liquid yeah. state. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I have a wonder, like, is there, uh, uh, so he says water, is there an effort to try to, like, apply this measure to, like, uh, and verify this uh, experimental thing? Um, applications that I recall now, uh, I said water, materials with defects, um, a protein database, um, a database also of not very large molecules, if you're from the chemistry field, you may have heard of von Lilien felt at Basel, who has a database it's called like POM30K. It's 130 or so uh, geometries of molecules of up to 20 atoms composed of hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Um, other applications I don't really have in my mind. Uh, you know, in many cases, the work, the, especially the recent work, it's been a demonstration of technology. Uh, the, the, the work that you've that will have been seen most often in real applications has been Bela Pardinello. And Bela Pardinello have tended to focus on molecules of around or, or molecular systems of about a hundred atoms or so. That's the typical application domain for Bela Pardinello. The ambition, especially of Schnetz and of other such methods, is to go to much larger systems. Uh, yeah, so material science, it, it's always the, the ambition, uh, and, and the, the methods are designed for those applications, but I cannot say that I've seen, you know, real demonstrations that this is the technology that you should be using for a specific system. 
Uh, but in principle, the way the methods are set up, they're applicable to do material simulation. Yeah, yeah. Large, large condensed phase systems, and that's certainly the ambition. That's, uh, yeah. But it's always a bit hard to make finally, if you look at the literature, if you look at any of these publications, to make finally an assessment of what impact the work will have, because it is so recent that the impact is not being shown. Right? People have, of course, they've, they've demonstrated that their method sort of works at some level, but the critical evaluation against, let's say, a type binding density function of has not been done. Uh, so you said that there was a, a great deal of a great deal of accuracy was achieved in with a Gaussian Gaussian approximation potential or yeah. crystals defects. What, yes. Um, could you just explain a little more what, what crystals and what? So oh, typically, uh, the applications there've been multiple. Um, uh, I'm most familiar with their tungsten application and where they studied uh, radiation damage configurations in tungsten, uh, but also silicon, uh, boron nitrate, a two element system. Um, uh, yes, uh, water, but then water in the crystal phase, I think, not liquid water. Um, I don't recall what others, but there have been quite a few. That method, Gaussian approximation potential, has been around for quite some time. Uh, and and sorry, and the defects, vacancies, interstitials, screw dislocations, uh, plane displacements. So so a quite rich variety of defects. Hmm. Um, yeah. I was wondering your, what's your take on um, using like symbolic regression to learn. Um, mathematical equation from some of these machine uh, Yeah, that's a, really a different field. Yes, uh, I, I've not I've not been involved and I've not studied uh, the symbolic manipulation that could be associated with this. For them. Uh, it's yeah, it's an active field of study as well in the machine learning community. I see, like, uh, but it's it's really different technology than than what I've paid attention to. I see, like Tim Mueller has been doing some stuff like that. Um, Tim Mueller, um, Schneck, they yeah. have been doing some stuff like that from their models, that's what I asked. Well, Schneck, they, they, they do use uh, differentiation tools, indeed. Uh, yeah, yeah. so uh, in, in many of these applications, indeed, the force field is a, a real, genuine analytical derivative of the potential energy. Yeah. And I don't know whether automatic differentiation tools were used or, or rather right. mechanical differentiation. Thank you. More questions? So, if you allow me, I would ask questions. Yeah. So, one question is uh, technical. Uh, you said that uh, you have a weight and uh, pro probably another parameter, so two parameters per atom uh, in the f uh, in the fitting procedure. Many more. Many more. So more, many more per atom. Many more, many more parameters per atom, yes. Per atom. Yes. So how, what are these? Well, uh, they are the weights. Uh, but uh, so let me go back. Um, the, uh, so the parameters that one has to learn are the weights in the neural network. Um, but, uh, but you would well, expect we, one we weight look, per atom. Let, let's look at the schnapps, for instance. You are talking about the shape of the Gaussian that might uh, addition uh, in, in There addition. would be also those parameters, yes. Yes, there are also parameters that are involved in creating the input layer, mm -hmm. correct. Uh, and, and once the input layer has been defined, mm -hmm. then the parameters that have to be learned by, let's say, your TensorFlow uh, software are the weights in the neural network. And the number of weights in the neural network is many, many times larger than the number of atoms. Uh, no, 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 no. It depends on the structure. Sorry, it, it sorry, it, it, I'm confused. Uh, it's a large number, but it has nothing to do with the number of atoms. Yeah. You learn the neural network and then you apply right. it to whatever is your atomic okay. system. Now, yeah. uh, uh, when you do uh, training, yes. you have to multiply these number of parameters with number of atoms because each of them is carrying uh, uh, some variety of parameters. So, now you, so, therefore, you have a huge number of training parameters to train yes. simultaneously. Uh, and uh, how do you, f uh, you call it fitting? You how do you train it? I mean, how do you get uh, 
problem, how do you solve the problem so, for thousands probably uh, variables the in point. this case? Yes. So the key word is stochastic gradient descent. Mm -hmm. right? But um, it's correct that to say that you have uh, typically many more unknown weights than you have training data. Um, I think in the case of the SCHNET network, they are of the size that I indicated earlier. Uh, Twenty. Okay, so let, let's let's do the number there. Maybe it's not much larger. Let's say twenty layers, um, two hundred and fifty-six. Let's say neurons per feature vector. That would be for each of these matrices. Let's all, only focus on this matrix. That is then 256 squared. Mm -hmm. So we get 256 squared times 20. Uh, so that's on the order of 60,000 or so times 20, a bit more than a million. Mm -hmm. And then there's whatever number of coefficients goes in here. So we're talking of millions of unknowns. They will not have millions of trading data. No, they will have much less. I mean, yeah. you mentioned one. And well, they will not have much less. Do they have any experimental data, probably? They, they, don't, they don't use experimental data. Okay, okay. so that might be a very much our defined system yes. of finance. Yes. yes. And uh, yes. so, uh, therefore, you cannot believe uh, unless you somehow benchmark your training uh, yes. once you do training. Yes. So how do you benchmark the training? Comparing with what? Comparing with calculations that were not in your training set. Right, so the, the standard way you have a training set and a test set, and they're all uh, the, so the benchmark is is not the experiment; it's the DFT calculations, and so you have training data and test data. Yeah, but at the, the end it has to be experiment. At the end it has to be experiment. We are physicists; we believe what what can be observed uh, and yeah, measured. Yeah, but uh, th that's another problem. I mean, the, here yeah. here we're trying to use machine learning. Mm to get an effective replacement for the expensive density function mm -hmm. theory calculations. So that, that uh, also um, implies another question, which is accuracy okay, of the measure. Yeah. So uh, uh, can you quantify the probability of uh, good training? Okay? For SVM, we discussed that. Okay, I, I can say uh, by comparison with the benchmarking data that it is, let's say, 90% or something like that. Uh, uh, is there any way uh, or has any but it tried uh, to, uh, to benchmark the probability uh, of getting a good training. Uh, I'm not aware of it in that formulation. Of uh -huh. course, uh, evaluating a root mean square deviation on a particular test set, that's totally routine. That's always normal. Uh -huh. Then there's always the question, is my test set a good reflection of the kind of geometries to which I will subsequently be applying my learned data. Well, you know, you, you may create a machine learned force field for certain applications and then you may decide I'm going to use it for different applications. Mm -hmm. You may have to reassess your accuracy. Okay. So, so these, are, these are very practical. Uh, and you uh, assess accuracy by phenomenology, probably, uh, or collective data, yeah. Comparison uh, with DFT. We, so we, take, we don't do experiments here. It gives what it gives. Sometimes it's good, sometimes yeah. it's bad. Yes, indeed. So yes. that's what. So we we're do. not trying to solve the problems of DFT. We're taking the DFT for granted. Yeah, well, I don't. Okay. <laughs> well, you could, but, if, if you can supply training data from another method, yeah, then those, yeah. those would be your training and your test data. Right, right. But in practice, for materials, it's density functional theory. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. I mean, this is really impressive uh, in promise, okay? It brought that, I, I think so too. Yes. Yeah. So, and uh, once again, it's a survey talk, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's really important to be familiar with this kind of work if you're in the materials or the 3D image processing community. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
Okay. Is that I, material? Is it plasma? I, I, uh, is that, uh, my point? interest here was in providing a survey. I do not think that I'm going to be competing right. with any of these people with my own Okay. Why not? Uh, because I have other things on my mind. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, right. yeah, yeah. No. So, um, my personal work is in oxygen radiation energy. Oh, wonderful! And I'm looking. I'm just so for fusion region. energy. Yeah, I'm Jason Delwix. Excuse me, Jason Delwix. Uh, yes. Here. Yes. Yeah. So I was very interested in that from the yes. like, where would you, one, I'd like to have a copy of the slides. Yes, I will send that to you. Uh, and um, the other is, um, could you like direct me to where, what I should be reading? Like, yeah. What so let me let me move on to slides that I skipped. Okay. Um, because I have specific slides on tungsten. Oh. Okay. Um, so you're working on tungsten? Yeah. Currently. For fusion. Yeah. At least. Um, Tertiary uh, quaternary systems. What department? I'm Jason. I'm with the young. I'm just saying. I'm with the same group as Young. Young. Young is same young group. Zan. Young Zan. So that must be. Uh, uh, Jason Trellowix. What oh, Jason. Science. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I see. I see. I know Young worked with you. That's why. Yeah, worked. Yeah. So look at this. Problems with potentials for materials and plasma material interaction. Okay. Um, and um, yeah. hydrogen retention and irradiated tungsten. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's a lot of interest in this, and you, you know it, of course. But this is the, this is the key fusion interest mm -hmm. in, um, let me explain this. Pure tungsten has a very low solubility for hydrogen, mm -hmm. 10 to the minus 5 or so. So the whole issue of uh, hydrogen trapping in tungsten is associated with uh, damage. Mm -hmm. So that's that makes irradiated tungsten so interesting. Um, and so, you'd like to do uh, computations, and I refer now to a talk by Andrea Sant, mm -hmm. who, um, I think she has left the field, uh, but she was working with Kai Nordland, who was a very well-known person mm -hmm. in Helsinki. Um, and this is a talk of two years ago, Energetic Cascades in Tungsten. Mm -hmm. and. Um, this is pure tungsten, so this is a fairly simple problem. Uh, no hydrogen or helium involved, pure tungsten. Mm -hmm. And uh, in her talk, she showed calculations using different interatomic potentials. Yeah, different interatomic potentials taken from the fairly recent literature. Oh, okay. um, and um, you know the sort of calculation. Uh, you take your tungsten initial state. Mm -hmm. You assume a primary atom. Mm -hmm. You you know you get your local melt region. It resolidifies, and some defects are left behind. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing for radiation damage is what's the statistics of those defects. Mm -hmm. and each individual calculation doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's finally the statistics of the defects after resolidification. Okay, mm -hmm. so different potentials. And all of these are credible potentials in the community. That is, they are used in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and she asks now, uh, how many, what fraction of vacancies are actually pairs or higher clusters of vacancies, mm -hmm. so not single vacancies? Mm -hmm. And it varies this way and, uh, as a function of PKA energy. Mm -hmm. So large variation, right? factors, factors of five or so mm -hmm. uh, easily. And, and at the highest energy, even a larger factor. Mm -hmm. um, she asks the same for uh, the clustering of the interstitials. Mm -hmm. Again, it's mono-elemental. Um, so again, a uh, large factor of difference between different potentials. And she was not able to say, you know, this is the right potential and all the others are wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, average number of Frankel press per cascade. Um, and this is on a logarithmic scale. So again, um, well, this is an outlier at low energy, mm -hmm. but at the higher energy, uh, this difference is again a factor of 10 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a lot so, of radiation, but it's still interesting. Yeah, so there, there's really big problems with the basic potentials. Mm -hmm. And my conclusion of this I don't like this situation, and I think the situation should not be this way. Mm -hmm. There's no real good excuse. Um, if you're doing plasma material interaction and, sorry, if you're doing irradiation damage, mm -hmm. basically the potential is everything. Mm -hmm. 
um, there's no nuclear effects on the quantum motion, right? The, the nuclei are classical particles. Mm -hmm. There yeah, is, indeed. of course, the issue of slowing down on the electrons. Mm -hmm. So an elevated electron temperature is a relevant concept, mm -hmm. but it's not so difficult to put that in. You need then the interaction potential as a function of electron temperature, and you need to couple it to a diffusion equation for the electron temperature. Mm -hmm. But though that is actually small fry compared to the cost of the interaction potential. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say this example of Andrea is in a way the simplest example, just mm -hmm. mono elemental tungsten. Mine is uh, the real problem of interest, well, uh, you could have steels which are really complicated, mm -hmm. but focusing on tungsten for fusion applications, yes. you really mm -hmm. have uh, hydrogen and helium, right? You always have helium if you have radiation damage. And the interest is finally hydrogen trapping mm -hmm. or hydrogen migration. So what's the primary radiation damage application? You have a primary knock-on atom. You get a melt region. You get resolidification. Um, since it's a three-component system, this is a bit more difficult than pure tungsten. Mm -hmm. It's not as difficult as steel. I mean, steel has this very sensitive dependence to very small fractions of, for instance, carbon. Mm -hmm. um, Quantum effects on the nuclear motion are, are not really relevant. Uh, mm -hmm. Only at really low temperature for, for different problems, not for the primary knock-on atom issue. Electronic excitation can be important, should be taken into account, mm -hmm. and it's not too difficult to take that into account. Mm -hmm. So I think that the fusion community has been a bit lagging, because this problem can just be solved, mm -hmm. um, given enough computer time. I mean, you really need to create uh, uh, the a high quality database mm -hmm. using large numbers of density functional theory calculations, mm -hmm. and you need to fit your potential, and, and that needs to be done in different ways. You need to explore different approaches. Mm -hmm. And I would say, really what you want is the potential for this three type of system mm -hmm. there, and I think this is, I don't know if this is now available. Two years ago, WH was done by a bunch of people, mm -hmm. and separately maybe W helium, but not the three mm -hmm. atom system. But it's uh, so totally uh, in line with what can be done with present technology. But it needs it needs hard work mm -hmm. and different different potential energy fitting strategies would have to be applied. Mm -hmm. But the large computational effort is in generating the data. Mm. So if one is generating the data in an intelligent way, then it's really mandatory, I think, to fit it in different ways. Mm. And even make it available to a larger community, try to get it, try to get machine learning people and React FF people all interested in fitting the same data. Mm. The main problem here is metal. Uh, yes, metals so, are metals with so, long range interactions. Uh, so all these metals. potentials that are currently used, probably the one that you're using too, are done with the, at most second neighbor. Mm. But metals, metal potentials are not localized. Mm. No, tungsten yeah, is of exactly course a metal, right. but tungsten does not have long range magnetic uh, effects. So, uh, there are people who promised to do uh, it uh, in Oxford, uh, for example. Um, uh, so up to up to five neighbors, okay. Yeah. So yes, there are some people who are doing that. It's it's quite difficult, okay, because uh, you have to do simultaneously uh, uh, DFT. They do, but DFT, of course, uh, with many atoms in order to get uh, central atom potential. Okay? So I think so, I think uh, tungsten uh, what is you are, easier. What you are talking to today about, uh, might be a, a solution uh, to that localization of metals. That's why I ask you whether you're talking about metals and yeah. how localized are your inputs yeah. uh, uh, and how do you train, train them. But yeah. that, is, that would be the solution because uh, all these impacts uh, uh, from fusion plasma like helium and hydrogen are standard, but before they are used on carbon and other non-metal materials, mm -hmm. no problem. I mean, uh, molecular dynamics works well. Uh, I mean, compared with experiments, excellent. But uh, once you introduce uh, uh, tungsten, doesn't have to be tungsten, or even uh, any of these 
metals, uh, and they are difficult to calculate because uh, they are traditional metals. I mean, yeah. so a lot of D orbits uh, above the S orbit, mm -hmm. and so you have to take yeah. into account even in EFT many atoms, many electrons uh, simultaneously. So these are difficult calculations. So yeah. difficulty in calculation of potential is main issue, and I wonder if this machine learning can. Uh, Help it. Uh, so I think I think machine learning has not yet demonstrated that it can that it can displace, let's say, semi-empirical mm -hmm. or parameterized uh, uh, tight binding, say, DFT. Um, and I think it would be really great if if there's computer time funding personnel available to just do this problem the way I think it should be done. I see. Massive calculations, build up a massive database and try to fit it or learn it in different ways. As far as the fusion is concerned, there is another problem here, it's a time scale. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is only the radiation damage problem. Yeah, so the this radiation is not damage time time is, is a very nanosecond, yeah. but uh, 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 the creation of hydrogen uh, uh, damage that is uh, diff diffusing inside yeah. uh, normally, okay? And what helium is does is very known. I yeah. mean, he doesn't like tungsten, so it cum accumulates between. Yeah. So this is a separate issue that you yeah. cannot Solve by that's, that's not okay. solved by yeah. uh, So this has to be done on different yeah. scale of time. Yeah. And so you have to go to med scale uh, rather than yeah. uh, than uh, uh, yeah. this uh, no, the problem for radiation physics, physics, okay, whatever you want to call it. Primary radiation. It's a primary, damage. yeah. That's that's the one from molecular dynamics. Yes, yeah. that's true. Okay. But uh, the long term evolution of damage, uh, the phase segregation of materials, the clustering of helium. Mm -hmm. That's a slow diffusion process. And in addition, uh, plasma is breathing as far as the uh, uh, simulation is concerned uh, yeah. in millisecond scale. Okay, so that's uh, about the step that they use in plasma uh, calculations. Sometimes lower than that, but yeah. not much lower. Uh, so this radiation are nanosecond, many orders of magnitude. Lower. So you actually, if you consider real plasma interaction with the uh, real metal, uh, you have to integrate over many orders of magnitude. And during that integration, other processes take place, okay? Mm -hmm. Like diffusion that you not, don't take into primary uh, radiation. No, the focus yes, here yeah. would be on the uh, primary radiation yeah, damage. Yeah. Yeah. So they yeah. Which is a kind of fundamental. You build it's fundamental. The, so the first the, thing the that, house yeah. uh, to understand the phenomenon. I, I find it interesting to know that uh, that there's the funding here to do that. Oh. Uh, is it, it? It must be because of fusion applications. Yes. Yeah. Because that's where, where my, it comes that my, my whole group works on, on fusion. Neat. Yeah. So I mean, I'm learning the modeling side. There's a point, but other people are experimental in fact. So people who okay. me, yes. Yeah. So do you work about. often at PPPL? Do you go there? Mm, I don't. Others okay. do. Yes. So that's what I was like. Yeah. So that's what I like, uh, could I have the presentation? So yes. Right yeah. Uh, give me your email message. Uh, your email. Um, or send me an email. Do, do it that way. Okay. I am BJ Browns. At CWI. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. CWI. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. My name was Yeah. Sean. Okay, have a nice day. Great. Uh, so, Bas, um, can you send me on? Yes, good. Cool. Yes. It has a lot of good effects. It, I've put a lot of time into it. Yeah. Yes. And it was really good uh, effort. You're a very systematic person, I didn't know that. Okay. okay. Uh, actually, I noticed that already yesterday, uh, uh, today, actually, in the discussion that we have. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this confirmed. Okay, I didn't have much opportunity to hear your talks, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this is. Uh, really, uh, very, very uh, success. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You want to turn uh, this off? Huh? You want to turn this off? I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. Uh, so, presenting a room, uh, room PC, laptop, uh, select source. Uh, yeah. No. Okay, we'll ask this later to come. Oh, oh there is one. Turn off, power turn off.